So uh, the first part of the class, I just want to give you a brief overview of how to prepare for this competition. And then I'm going to ask for volunteers uh, if they're ready to play something for us. If not, that's fine too. So uh, this is totally at your comfort level. Um, if you know you want to play and you're super excited, will you go ahead and put it in the chat that you want to play something today? I would appreciate that. That way I can plan how much time for each person. This class will probably be an hour to 90 minutes, depending on how many people want to play. So that'll help us plan the class. Okay. You should be able to see a PowerPoint now. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. And in the chat... I am going to share to everyone in the meeting this slide set. So if you need to translate it later or you want to have it for later to review, it'll be there for you. Let me know if you have any issues opening that Google Doc. Um, okay, so Preparing for recordings. This is something that you want to uh, practice and think about. You need to plan your preparation, okay? Um, prepare, prepare, prepare. Uh, take comfort in your preparation. A lot of students and even performers get anxious if you're just throwing something together. You want to make sure you feel comfortable with what you're doing, and the best way to do that is to have a plan. And always remember, if you're doing your best, that's always enough, okay? So don't feel like you have to compare yourself to everyone else. Your own growth is very important. And recording can be um, a really great process to help you grow. It's probably the best, one of the best things you can do as a musician in your growth is to practice recording yourself, okay? And don't worry, it doesn't take much money at all. Some devices you already have record and that's going to be good enough. If you can invest even $50 or $100, you can get some really nice equipment um, that can be even better. But if you don't have anything, that's fine. You can use your phone. You can use your computer. Um, you don't have to have fancy equipment for this competition, okay? But I'm going to show you some things that if you did decide to upgrade just even a little bit of money, you might have something that's really nice and will last you uh, a long time <clears throat> as you prepare to record yourself. Okay, so make a timeline. That's the first thing you want to do. Um, picking your piece that you're going to record, whether you're preparing for a recording for a competition or you're doing a recital, you want to at least six months to pick out your piece. That's ideal. If you don't have that much time, that's okay. If you have more time, that's even better. Depends on the piece that you're playing. Some pieces are an investment. Maybe it takes a year to learn if it's super complex. Maybe it has um, tons of technical things that you have to practice at a quarter speed. Or maybe you have quarter tone fingerings or multiphonics that you have to learn that are really tricky. Those things don't just happen overnight. You need to be patient, okay? Um, in the two to three months leading up to your recording, you need to be doing lots of score study. So listening to different recordings while following along with the score so you really know what's happening, not just in your part, but if you're playing something with piano, knowing the piano part really well too. So if you know, oh, is this an important phrase for me or is the piano more important? Or what rhythm does the piano have while I'm sustaining this long note so I know how long to hold this, you know? So really careful score study is important. Listening to several recordings um, for style, for inter interpretations, not that you have to be a copycat, but just so you know what kind of style to expect. And then you can take some ideas from this performance and ideas from this performance and then put your own ideas and make your own interpretation as an artist of what you want to do and play. And more importantly, you need to contact a pianist early enough so that you can collaborate if you choose to use a live pianist. Some of these um, submissions can be pre-recorded piano tracks. I know there's a variety of those on YouTube. Make sure you ask for permission from the YouTube person if you're going to use their recording. 
Um, or if you have a local pianist that you're working with, you can ask them to record a track and you can put it together asynchronously. Okay, that's another option if you're worried about COVID and social distancing, or if you're comfortable recording with piano, you can do that as well. But make sure you contact your collaborator early in advance so that they are available and um, you can start rehearsals right away. Six weeks prior, you need to start rehearsing with your pianist if you're using piano and be able to play through your entire selections of your repertoire. You don't wanna wait too long to start working on the whole sections of your piece. You want to know your whole piece. Even if everything's under tempo, you want to be able to play through your entire piece. Um, ask for a practice recording if your pianist is willing to. Um, that way you don't have to rehearse every day with your pianist. You can have that recording at home and you can practice for intonation. You can practice if you're playing from memory. That's a really fantastic way to start memorizing a piece is playing your repertoire with a practice recording. And you can even have the practice recording at a different tempo. You could have it slower if you're still working up certain, certain sections. Sometimes I'll ask a pianist, okay, I'd like you to record this section 20 clicks under, um, and then next week could we record again at tempo? And it can be a longer process. It doesn't have to be, okay, here we go. We're recording with piano right away. You need to make sure you have all of these smaller steps so you can get to your bigger goal. Um, this also helps with score study, listening through the recording. You're not just listening to your own playing, you're listening to the whole thing. And that's really important so you know how your part fits with piano. Um, in your own practice, focus on weaker sections instead of always starting at the beginning. So I'm guilty of this too. When you first learn a piece, you always start at the beginning, right? Well, maybe the beginning isn't the hardest part. Maybe it's the middle or the treacherous end that's super showy, right? So maybe work backwards, you know, think about, okay, today I'm going to start in the middle of this piece and really make it strong. And then tomorrow I'm gonna to start at the end of the piece and then work my way backwards because the end is what we all hear and we leave that performance with the end in the mind and we're thinking, oh man, the end was a little rocky but the opening was super strong. So those first, this first section and the end section, those really leave a lasting impression on your audience. So make sure you're not always practicing at the beginning and then running it. Start in different places, okay? Um, make sure you review sections every day. So if you've worked really hard on a small chunk, go ahead and play the rest of your piece too because you don't want to lose momentum. You don't want to forget what you've already practiced. So it's very important that you practice all of it every day and then focus on specific smaller sections as you're working up your repertoire. One month before, you should probably work on scheduling your recording. Maybe you have a space in mind. Maybe it's at your house in your living room and you need to tell your family, hey, this is a day I'm recording. I need you to be quiet, <laughs> okay? Or look with their work schedule and say, okay, my, my brother and sister are working this day. I'll have the house to myself. I can record, okay? But schedule it so that it's not a surprise and you're trying to record and there's a bunch of noise going on, right? Or if you're lucky enough to find a bigger space like a school room or a church or a local community place or a bigger space that has nice acoustics that's easy to get to, maybe you can even uh, reserve a space. You don't have to. Obviously, you can do this at home, um, and that's great too. Just try to find the best sounding space in your in your uh, apartment or your house or wherever you are. Okay. Um, keep in mind what time of day you play the best. Sometimes we're morning people. Some people are night people. Some of us are super tired in the afternoon. You know your body. Okay. So plan a time of day that you're at your best. Okay, and try to schedule more than one recording date. 
if you try to put it all in one day, if you're not feeling particularly good that day, it, it might not be the best and then you'll feel rushed and stressed. So give yourself plenty of time to record. Give yourself a few dates so that you have plenty of time and you feel nice and relaxed. Um, one month before, you should also be rehearsing with your pianist. Um, you should be practicing in the mirror and start recording yourself. Um, and this is really important because you want to see if you're doing anything awkward. Are you moving too much? Is the lighting bad? How is the sound quality? All these things you need to practice before you turn in your final submission. And if you wait until you know, right before it's due, you won't have time to adjust, okay? You need to have time to adjust. Um, watch and listen back and follow while you're looking at the score. So a score study, you've recorded yourself, then look with the score and said, oh, I was rushing here, make note for next time. Oh, I dragged here, and make note for next time. Man, my articulation wasn't very clear here. Ooh, that intonation. Be your own teacher outside of your lessons, and you can do a lot taking yourself away from playing the instrument and actually just listening to yourself. I think that's the best thing about recording is um, self-critiquing and hearing all of your flaws and then the next time you go to record, fixing it and seeing your growth and improvement every time you record yourself. Um, endurance wise, you should be starting to playing through your rep at this point to make sure that you're going to make it through some of these pieces that you might be picking are exhausting to perform and you want to make sure you have good breath control and that you can make it through without stopping. So that's really important. Um, I always tell people you should be able to play through your piece three times in a row without stopping because then you know your embouchure and your air are just going to be strong enough plus the mental endurance of not making mistakes that's so hard because you get exhausted really fast recording yourself two to three weeks before it's a great idea to play for other people. So classes like this, uh, if you have a private teacher or a friend or relative and say, hey, can I just play this for you? Then you can get nervous. You can get an outsider's feedback. Um, and you can ask them, okay, what did you like? What didn't you like? And next time you'll be able to adjust your performance because it's still a few weeks before it's due. Um, to simulate recording or performance experiences. Some of us get nervous and get out of breath. I don't know if that's happened to you. That's a, definitely an anxiety thing. So maybe you can run around the block and then play your piece and that'll simulate the same kinds of adrenaline feelings. Or you can put your hands in the freezer. Some of us get cold hands and then try to play our piece. And then if it, it still works well, you know how to manage those symptoms. Another thing I tell people, um, put your clarinet uh, together right away and play whatever audition or um, piece you're going to record. And if you can play it perfectly from case to face, you know you're going to do really well if you get that extra warm up in. I'm not saying do that all the time, but it's a great way to see if you're prepared Okay, if you can play it cold at 3 a.m., someone wakes you up at 3 in the morning, could you play your piece? <laughs> it's a little extreme, but this is a, a very good preparation tactic. And if you talk to a bunch of people who've won auditions and orchestras, that's a, a popular choice is to wake up in the middle of the night and run your excerpts. And then if you can do it perfectly, you're probably ready for the audition. Okay, so that's a really good practice technique. Okay, so again, two to three weeks before, start recording yourself in the space, okay? I think it's important. Then you can listen back and say, oh man, the clarinet is not loud enough, the piano is too loud, and then you guys adjust. Or the lighting isn't good, how can we fix this? Or um, you can check your mic gain, and I have a, a nice um, video we're gonna watch here in a second about um, mic placement and different microphone options that are built into your phone or your computer or even just upgrading a little bit of money and to get something nicer. Um, we'll do a comparison. Um, but if you use a microphone, checking the balance is very important. You want to play something that's soft 
and you want to play something that's the loudest part of your piece. That way you don't get mic clipping, okay? It'll distort the sound and you don't want that. And it would be really a shame if you recorded your whole piece and then realized, oh man, my mic clipped and you're out of time. That would be really bad. So I think you should try to practice recording yourself a couple weeks before so that you can check on all of this. Also, it takes a long time to set up for a recording project. Um, sometimes the setup could take an hour if you're being really picky with the camera focus and the lighting. And if you only booked a two hour time, that eats into your recording, right? So you wanna know how long it takes for you to get set up you want to practice setting up for recording, have a nice background. You don't want to be dressed like in sloppy clothes. Make sure your hygiene looks good, uh, you know? So we look at you and you're like, oh, that's very professional looking and do what you can with what you have. You don't have to be an amazing concert hall. Just, you know, make a nice clean backdrop, maybe tidy up if you're doing it in your own room or something. Um, so that, those are my points for you for two to three weeks before. Then one to two weeks before, make sure you're comfortable with your own equipment. Um, you need to practice, especially if it's something that's new, you wanna know how it works. And so practice recording yourself, obviously. Um, and then my husband made this amazing video. Let's see if it'll load. Um, I'm gonna reshare just a second here. So this is recording with a phone, with a laptop, with a, a, an affordable USB mic, and then some nicer microphones. And you're just gonna hear the difference. It's gonna be a chromatic scale um, full range chromatic scale on each device. And let me know if you can hear this or not. I shared the sound, but sometimes Zoom is fun. There's no sound yet, I'll let you know. <laughs> Can you guys hear the scale? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. So at the top now, it where it flattens, that's called clipping. Okay, you hear how it distorts the sound? So that means the gain is too high and the computer uh, microphone is clipping the louder stuff. I'm gonna go back a little bit so you can hear it. You should hear some harmonics. There's more than one pitch happening, so it's distorting by adding a harmonic. We'll go back a little bit. Do you guys hear the distortion? A little bit maybe okay and then the next one this is the same mic i'm using right now um, it's called a neat bumblebee mic and it's less than a hundred dollars it's a usb So no distortion at all, and it's just a little upgrade. Bye. 
So obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, the professional ones nicest, but the other ones were also very clear and more affordable. Okay. And this link is in the um, PDF that I posted in the chat. If you are just coming in late, I know that sometimes you can't see the chat after you enter, if you come in after it's been put in there. So I put it in again for those coming in after. So that's the, the document that I'm sharing a PowerPoint. I turned into a PDF and the link to that video is in there. Okay, so it doesn't cost very much to get something that is clear. And of course you can just use your phone and your computer. I don't know if you noticed, but in this video, uh, the placement of the mic from uh, the clarinet was about two meters. Okay, two meters. So you don't want it to be too close to you or you're gonna get a lot of reed noise, spit sound, things that you feel and hear, air noise, but in the audience, you don't hear. So if you were in a concert hall and you're sitting in the chair in the, in the audience, you wouldn't hear all that read noise and stuff. So um, make sure the mic is further away from you so that it's not picking up all of that excess noise. Um, it's really important. And again, do a sound check before you do your full run through. Make sure you're wearing nice professional attire. All black is always easy. Um, does it still fit? You want to try it on before you record, you know, COVID. Some of us might be a little bit different than we were a year ago, pre pandemic. I know, um, some of my clothes aren't fitting the same way anymore. So <laughs> check your outfits to make sure they still fit. Do you need to schedule a haircut or do you need to uh, groom or shave before? So make sure you look really professional and when you look your best, you're gonna play at your best, okay? You wanna make sure that you can actually breathe in your clothing too. So practice wearing your clothes and make sure you can play through your repertoire in those clothes. Okay, the week of, make sure you're eating well. Don't eat anything too spicy or super salty or rich. You don't wanna have a tummy ache or have like sore lips from, um, from uh, really spicy food. Make sure you're very hydrated so you can think. I always take electrolytes the day before or something that's really strenuous. Um, lots of water and uh, the day of the recording, plenty of water. If you get dry mouth, there's a few tricks. Eat some bananas. Dark chocolate also will help with that. If you don't have either, you can just gently bite your tongue and some water will come back into your mouth, which is a pretty cool trick. Just don't hurt yourself. Um, if you're exercising, that's great. Just don't push it. I wouldn't say do a, a marathon and then do a recording session. That would be pretty brutal because you need your air and your strength. So some light exercise is great, but be careful. Um, get lots of sleep if you can. Stay calm. There's great meditation videos on YouTube you can do for free. Go for a walk, yoga, whatever helps you relax and calm down so that you can be at your best. The day of the recording. Don't play too much before you record. You don't want to overplay and get exhausted during the recording session. So warm up, but don't do too much, okay? Eat some healthy carbs so you have energy. Nothing too rich again, but something that'll let the last with you and that you can burn and use for fuel. Um, you need some protein as well. Um, give yourself plenty of time to get ready. You don't want to feel rushed, okay? If you feel rushed, it can set your mood to be in a hurry and then you won't feel as calm. So these things always take longer than you think. Um, just give yourself plenty of time. Always swab out between every take. How many of you have gotten water and it was like a great run through and then, oh man, I had water in one of my tone holes. So every time swab out, even if you don't need to, just do it. It'll be better. Okay, um, check your intonation and the tempo before every take so it's very consistent. As we get playing and warmed up, the intonation goes sharper and sharper. And if we're playing with piano, we wanna make sure that we are in tune, okay? Or just being in tune with yourself even if you're not playing with piano, okay? That your intervals are good. Um, take good notes about each take. That way, if you forget, you don't have to go back and waste a bunch of time. So every take, 
just jot a few notes about what you liked and didn't like. It'll save you a big headache later. And if you have someone helping you record, like a friend who presses record, they can also take notes for you too. So that's very helpful. And it's nice to have another opinion. Um, in my experience, usually the first few takes are the best. Okay, after that, you start to get tired and frustrated and it's kind of a downward <laughs> slope. So it might be good to take a break and come back. And this is why I think you should have more than one recording session so that if you have done your best for the day, you can come back and try again another day when you are strong and fresh. Um, and also remember to have fun. Remember this is supposed to be fun and not stressful. It's the clarinet. We're sharing our music with everyone. So remember that it's not super serious. Yes, you want to be professional, but you're supposed to be making music and enjoying this. Okay. Um, for submission time, don't wait till the last second to turn it in. Maybe your computer scheduled an update. Maybe your Wi-Fi is down. Maybe the website's having problems. There's so many things that could happen with technology these days. So don't wait until the deadline to turn it in. Also, uploading your files takes some time. The video files are large, so you need to make sure plenty of time to get your recordings uploaded. Okay, so that wraps up my presentation. If you have any questions, we can start with that. And then I will take volunteers to play. You guys have any questions? Don't be shy. I can also put my email address in the chat if you want to email it later, if you remember after the class. You can email me questions there. Okay, do I have any volunteers who would like to play for us today? Anyone? I don't have my instrument with me. I'm at my girlfriend's right now, but I did put together a submission if you would like me to share that. Oh, do you want to share it? Sure. Do you have yeah, it? It's, it's in, already um... been, I have a, I have the video on my computer. It's already been rejected because um, I had to edit together the um, introduction and the um, actual performance recording. Piece. Right. That also has to be in one take, right? Yeah. You have to do your introduction and then keep the camera going when you start playing. Well, if you and want to share the video of your performance, I'd be happy to give you some feedback and tips. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Okay. So um, do you want to share your screen? I can, I can put multiple participants can share in the, or do you want um, to put the video in the chat? And then I can share it. What are you comfortable with? Um, if, you, if I could share my screen, I think that'd be... Okay. I just easy. gave permission for you to do that. Awesome. Give me one sec. While you're doing that, Henry, what piece are you playing? I guess you're introduced it, huh? <laughs> In the video. Yeah. I, let me start playing it. Um, Henry, did you click the box share sound too when you shared the screen? Because we can't hear. So what you have to do is you hit share screen and then there's a little check box to share sound too. It'll be on the bottom left on the option for share screen. So you hit share screen and okay. there should be a Can little you... box. Okay. Uh, have... Let me start playing it now and see if that works. Hi, my name is Henry. That's better. And can you all hear that well enough? Yes. Robert Strain and Dr. Joshua Gardner. I will be submitting, for your pleasure, Errol's Hands, which I performed at my recital about a week and a half ago on March 1st this year. Please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. 
Wonderful, Henry. Fantastic. So tell me, where was this in the recital? In the program? Like the middle, beginning? This was the last piece. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. That was so, a little bit tired. But... Okay. I was going to ask. I mean, you sound fantastic. Um, and obviously for this re competition, you might want to just record it without having all the other pieces on your recital first so you have more endurance. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it was fantastic. I think the balance at the beginning, you could play out more because at the beginning, I felt the, the track was louder than you. And I don't know if that was intentional. Maybe it says to do that in the score, but I could use more of you at the very beginning. When you sing into the highest register stuff, it comes across really clearly. But in the beginning, I don't think you're quite in that register yet. You're in the lower register, right? So I think either you need to have uh, more volume from you or the placement of the microphone needs to be closer to you and the tracking stuff further away. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so nice. I think the balance at the beginning could be something that you work on for sure. And that I wrote that down. Um, voicing, did you play... Uh, a lot of soprano clarinet on this recital, or was it all bass clarinet? 50-50, uh, exactly. Okay. I think that's also something to keep in mind for this competition. Like, if you're playing a bunch of soprano clarinet the day of a recording for bass clarinet, your voicing might not always be, like, as clean. I know for me, if I have a recording session on bass clarinet, I won't play any B-flat clarinet that day. I will just be focused on bass, because I think that sometimes... The voicing wasn't locked in right away. Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. And I find that if I'm playing B flat back and forth, which is fine for gigs and things going back and forth, but if I want this to be like the best recording I can do, I want to only play bass that day. Okay. And maybe practice B flat clarinet, baby clarinet after the recording project's over or something. But same thing with um, soprano clarinet. If I'm going to be playing something super um important on soprano clarinet i'm not gonna be playing a bunch of bass clarinet right before because i want my voicing to be super locked in on that instrument you know um the other thing i noticed there's some tension in your shoulders how is that is that a jazz set um uh, harness what kind of harness are you using there um what is it called i forget the exact name but it's this um korean um harness that just sits on my shoulders, which is really convenient, actually. It doesn't is have it the, um, comfortable? It's pretty comfortable, but I've actually been thinking about selling it and getting a slightly bigger one. I just, it seems like shoulders. your shoulder's getting tight midway through, and it feels like the instrument is heavy. But I, I just, what I'm looking at with your body, it looks a little tight. And me, I like a peg, and I know the peg is limiting because you can't walk around very much, but it does let my shoulders relax more. So if you could find something that's more comfortable so your shoulders can come down a bit and just relax, they seem really tight, okay? okay. Um, uh, I love the harnesses. They're so freeing, but this one seems like it might be impacting your comfort a bit. And if yeah. you're thinking about your shoulders and the weight of the instrument, you're not thinking about the making of music, you know? <laughs> I, have, I have been thinking about getting a new one, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. I was using one for a while that it was this piece I was playing in an art gallery. It was like a really fun mural. The music was in little circles of color and each um, cell was in a different circle. And my I was wearing... Um, uh, what do you call it? It was like a pro cam, like one of those pro go cams that like tracks what you're watching in a helmet. And so the accompaniment would change based on what color I was looking at. And so I would be playing music and then the background would change, but I had to have a walking setup like what you have with the harness. But I could only play for like half an hour before my shoulders were just so mad. And this was before my injury. It just was a heavy instrument and I felt like, oh, all the weight's here. So if you can find something that distributes the weight more evenly, that would be a good thing. Okay. Um, in the middle, I lost the groove just a little bit. I'm not sure like the timing wasn't 
perfect with the track. So um, you might want to revisit that spot. And what I do when I'm playing something that's pre-recorded like that, I'll play super quietly, like kind of just breath through the instrument so I can really focus on the back track. Sometimes when we play loudly, we can't hear, like our, our ears will protect us and they close off. Like if I'm playing super loud and aggressive or if I'm playing like a duo or something with my husband, he's got like really high notes in my ear, I can't hear <laughs> anymore like what's happening. So I would say play this like, super softly just to really get into the groove and then once you get it make sure you play out and and play the full sound that you want okay uh, some of your high register stuff again i think this had to do with where the program where it was in the program you said it was at the end and then also you were playing some soprano clarinet before but maybe do some more voicing exercises um what kind of voicing exercises do you do, Henry? Um, the ones that uh, your husband actually gave me to do. Uh, oh, good. Yeah, he um, wanted me to uh, slur down through the harmonic series without like changing the um, octave key. So just on bass clarinet. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then clarinet and soprano. Um, do you just, overblow twelfths too? Um, do you do any of that kind of stuff? Uh, no, but I think you should, and then you can even find the partial above. And go up and down. I don't know if I'm blasting through the mic. That might be a little bit loud. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. It is a little bit. I will turn my mic down. I had it set for my voice. So let me just turn it down and I'll move further away. And you just play around with voicing all the way as low as you can go. Okay, um, that will be really helpful for flexibility and just uh, more accuracy. So all I was doing was playing an open G and then overblowing and then overblowing again and then coming back down and then you just go to an F sharp overblow and then another partial and then come back down. And I would just keep going as low as you can go just so that you're really good at jumping um, another thing would be doing arpeggios, more three octaves, um, and leaping there so that you get really good at leaping. Do you do that on bass clarinet? I know you do a lot of warm-ups probably. Yeah, I do. I've been uh, working on warm-ups on bass clarinet. Okay. All right. Good. Most of good. the time I do it on soprano, so it's I think been a little should... bit of adjustment. Yeah. I think the voicing is so different on bass clarinet. It's a different animal. And so you really just have to spend more time warming up on it and doing these same voicing exercises you would do on soprano clarinet, but it feels so different. Everything's exaggerated. I feel like when I'm playing in the altissimo, I throw the note to the back of my throat, if that makes sense. It's very like on off and we're in soprano clarinet and making smaller adjustments with the voicing and um, bass clarinet it's more aggressive and not that i'm playing aggressive just the changes are more drastic okay um did you have any let's see so i got through all my notes do you does anyone from the audience have anything for henry i thought that was a really cool um recording Bravo. It sounded really nice. I'm excited. Are you going to re-record it for the competition? Yeah, I'm thinking I'm going to do that. I think you should. And then you can work on those balance things, the groove things, and you won't be tired from playing your full recital. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, you do. I saw someone in the chat. Um, both, voice, uh, both, both hands need to be in the video. So we need to be able to see your hands. So the camera angle, I think, needs to be different for your video submission. Okay. Yeah. Do you, I see we got the guidelines up here for Silverstein Works. 
contest. I think it says both hands. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, my hands were kind of hidden behind the stand. That's tricky. I think that's the, the limitation of using a concert hall video, right? That was the, was that the recital hall? Uh, yeah. But you did, did you bring your own camera or is that just the one that was built in the recital hall? Um, my dad actually did bring his own camera, but it also, my hands were behind. They were covered. The, yeah. yeah. It's tricky. You might have to get more of a side view so you can see the hands and the stands not in the way. Yeah. Okay, good. Does anybody else want to play or share a recording they made? I think that was a really great way of sharing your performance. So thank you for doing that. If you don't want to play, that's okay. Or do you want to play? Jason, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to ask a question if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ask <laughs> um, in competitions in general, like I've all, we all know that there's no such thing as a perfect performance. So what does, what goes through a mind of a jury when a performer makes a mistake? Um, it's very forgiving. If the energy is there and you're just, you know, kicking butt everywhere else, like you may have like the most pristine, beautiful sound and you're making music, a little flaw can go unnoticed. And you know what? We're human. That's what makes this really fun. We're not computers. We want to hear that human element. I want to hear phrasing. I want to hear beautiful sounds. I want you to make something new of a piece that I've heard before, or maybe you introduce me to a piece I've never heard, you know? So I think that's the exciting part is making the music. And we, I, I'm ashamed to say this too. I focus on that little mistake every time and it can ruin ruin the experience for you right so keep going how many of you have recorded something and you stopped because you made a silly little mistake and you just you didn't go any further but then the rest of the performance was awesome right and it's just you have to be able to live with their flaws you know so you have to know that there's going to be something about every recording you make that you're not happy with, but that's where the improvement comes from because next time you try harder and you try harder. So at the end of the day, it's what can you live with when you turn it in? <laughs> but that's a good question. I'd rather hear like the most beautiful recording with a tiny flaw than you being ultra careful and not making any big statements. Good question, Jason. Other questions? Anybody else want to play anything? We don't have to. We can just talk. It's up to you all. I can share a video. Yeah? That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, disclaimer, it is a bad example of the recording, but oh, anyway, no. yeah. Okay. I mean, like video quality wise, but I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh... <laughs>
sharing that. Um, Gregory has offered to translate into Spanish if anyone um, would like him to translate. He has offered that so please let us know if you would appreciate that. Okay all right so uh, bravo that sounds killer. You have been working really hard so pat yourself on the back. Amazing okay. Um, I have a few comments for you. Watch out for excess motion. I love when your movement goes with the phrase, but sometimes the movement does not go with the phrase and it can get in the way. Um, uh oh, do we lose Jason? I don't see him anywhere. <laughs> uh oh, I wonder if he accidentally left the meeting when he stopped to share. Oh, I think so. <laughs> We, we can wait a minute see if he comes okay. back but you know what the recording quality was really good even if it wasn't like something fancy it was still clear and we got an idea of dynamics and there was a lot of clarity there so you don't have to have something fancy right there he is now i can give him feedback let me let him back in <laughs> Welcome back, Jason. I'm so sorry. <laughs> My oh, computer decided no. to crash. Oh, no. Well, that was really fast. I was just complimenting the recording quality. Even though it wasn't super fancy, everything was clear. I could hear dynamics. I could hear articulation. So it, what you're using is great, okay? You don't need to spend money. Um, just that video comparison just to show you, okay, this is basic, a little bit more, a little bit more fancy, just so you hear the differences between them all. I think that is fun. Okay, so I was saying you have a little bit of excess motion going on in your body. You know this, right? And sometimes it's really with the music and the phrasing, and then other times it's a little distracting. So I think that's something to work on. Um, when it's with the music, go for it. But if it's something that you're just like keeping the beat yourself, try not to advertise it so much, okay? Um, I thought that you could take more time between phrases. Let us digest more what you're doing, okay? Because you're doing amazing things. You're all over the horn. You've got all sorts of different styles and articulations. Let us just savor it a little bit more. Okay, um, voicing, I wrote voicing again. When you get to that super altissimo, every now and then there's this tiny little subtone or crack, right? Eat the mouthpiece. 
<laughs> okay? When you have those super high notes, just take more thumb up and you're voicing, it sounds like you're doing what you need to. So I think maybe just a little more read in the mouth might help with that. Then I'm not sure what the dynamic range because I don't have a score in front of me for those low powerful notes. It sounded like you were trying to put a lot of power in some of your low register. I think you do more because the high register is really cutting through. Do you have your clarinet with you? Uh, I have to set it up, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's by me, yeah. Okay, All right. what I want you to do is go ahead and set it up. This is an exercise that I do myself. I'll play the loudest low note I can with a good sound and then go back in the phrase and see if you actually made it to that dynamic. Because a lot of times when you're leaping around or in the context, you forget how loud you truly can be on those low notes. And I might be biased as a bass player, but you really need to bring out the low register of the clarinet. It just doesn't speak as well. And so if you have something that's marked up like a forte or fortissimo in the low register, we really have to exaggerate down there because the high notes, they just come out, you know, we don't even have to try with the dynamics there. They will be forte. <clears throat> then I have to ask you another question about your articulation. What part of the tongue is touching what part of the reed? The tip. And the tip. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. And we're hundred percent certain of that all the time. Mm, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. If you ever want to check it, you can buy a washable marker, the non-toxic kind. Um, and you can draw like a darker color, like blue or something, and then tongue a couple of notes and see where it's touching on the tongue. That's a really good trick. Every now and then I heard maybe some that were coming in just a little bit below the tip and there was a little bit extra thunk to the articulation. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we are actually using the tip. So first thing we're gonna do is check the volume of the low notes and then I'm gonna give you a tonguing exercise to see if you're actually touching with the tip all the time. Okay. So play your low E with your best, biggest sound. Lovely. So now, whenever you play your piece in context, I want your low register to be that powerful when you get there. Do you think that you matched that in the recording or do you think it was a little less? Hey, I think it was a little this okay so now you know it's something to keep you honest okay this is yeah. how much i can project here and then make sure when you go back that you do that okay mm -hmm. all right here's another exercise for articulation this is called an interruption um you're gonna take the tip of your tongue and slowly touch here okay i don't want you to stop the read all the way so when i play an open g a subtone when I'm touching the reed like it's softer mm -hmm. yeah okay I'm not sure if the sound quality is so good um, but the intonation when I'm touching the tip goes sharper mm. I'll do it again yeah. if I'm touching below the tip the intonation goes flat or lower you to try. It's going low. Yeah. Yeah. So aim a bit higher. If you can get the tip of your tongue behind your top teeth here and hiss for me. Get that arch of your tongue high. Try the exercise again. Okay, good. The first one was going higher, yeah. second one lower, third one higher. So yeah. I hate to put you on the spot, but I would play that every day 
just for target practice with your tuner on, no matter where you are when you start, if it's at the tip, the pitch will go higher. Mm. If it's below the tip, the pitch will go lower. This is super important for tonguing lightly, okay? Not every, t I won't do this all the time, but this is just for light articulation and to really refine what part of the tongue is touching, what part of the reed. Um, so I would start maybe on a C and do a scale as the first exercise. Each note two times with the subtone. You'll notice as you go higher into the second register, it's gonna get more difficult. This is kind of like tongue yoga. Altissimo, it gets even more difficult. But then you'll be able to tongue super fast and light if you're only touching the tip. If you touch below the tip in Altissimo, you get grunts, squawks, and squeaks. Okay, I'm not saying you did this. I just heard some heavier stuff in the sound, and this is a great exercise to clean that up. Okay, and just to have better tongue awareness. Okay, I have another exercise that I want everyone to try this. Okay, so take the tip of your tongue behind your front teeth and swallow, but don't let the tip move. Is that hard? It's awkward. But you need to learn tongue independence. So the back of the tongue is what we use for all the voicing, the jumping and stuff. And the tip needs to be ready for touching the reed. So if you can do that, you'll be able to keep the tongue ready to go where it needs to be at the right place. Plus the voicing is ready for uh, jumping. Okay, so that's a really fun little exercise you can do at a party. Hey, can you put your tip of your tongue here and then swallow? <laughs> but you need to be able to have tongue independence. We use the tip for articulation, the back for voicing, and the middle to refine the sound and to make sure that the air is moving. That high arch is very important. Very lovely playing. Okay, uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about in your performance is the sound and your softs. The tone, I think it could match better when you're playing out. There's like a, a quality that I want it to be more clear. Right now it's a little hazy. So things we can do to make your soft sound clearer. Um, you can use more corner pressure. You can think about your nose down stretching like a bunny rabbit. Okay. Think about having an Easter egg in your mouth. It must be Easter soon. And then the fast, fast air. So I asked you to play your loudest, and I want you to play any note you like and try to decrescendo to your softest, but don't let the sound go. Okay? That's lovely. So I think making the details in your piece come out. The loud's full and beautiful, the soft's pristine and clear, and just as beautiful as the rest of your playing. Make everything match. I want quality sound, quality articulation, okay? Um, I think you're doing amazing t things. Your technique is phenomenal. So these are just little picky things that will make it even better, okay? Wonderful. I loved listening to you, Jason. Awesome.